That's all right. Well, good evening, church. Oh, yeah. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Tyrone, and I have the privilege of speaking to you guys tonight about uh, being best friends of all time uh, in Christian relationships. And uh, I passed out the notes earlier tonight, so um, if you're visiting with us, I encourage you to just nudge the person right next to you to get the notes. Uh, but again, I'm going to be uh, talking about um, a Bible study, um, which is a part of a series that we uh, go through with those who are studying the Bible. And, um, and so this one in particular is about building friendships within the church. Mm. Um, you know, studies have shown that relationships are one of the keys to success in life and in workplace. Um, your relationships can, uh, can do a lot of uh, great things for you. They can and be very, very helpful. Uh, one, they can remind you of why you love your job. Mm. Uh, they can give you an outside perspective. Uh, they can build your confidence. Uh, they, uh, these people can be your personal cheerleaders. Um, and, and also, uh, for those of us who are either dating or married, well, more specifically married, uh, for, the, for the husbands, uh, your wives can help, uh, help you look your best. Oh. Um, yeah. But if the world can recognize that relationships are important in life, then how much more should we as Christians recognize the importance of having relationships in the church? Mm. Uh, which is why we're having uh, this study tonight. Um, and we need to understand that when it comes to being a Christian in God's church, mm. uh, living as a Christian is not something that you can do alone. Um, that's something that a lot of people uh, believe that they believe that um, with your relationship with God, it's a, it's a personal relationship. So therefore, um, it, whatever whatever you do, that that's only between you and God. Mm. Um, and so, what this reminds me of, um, I mean, there are a lot of people. Um, I mean, even uh, even uh, Christians in churches nowadays, those who have been Christians for for many many years, um, independence can easily take you out. Yeah. Um, I've had I've had flatmates in the past who have uh, who have acted very independent. Um, and as a result, they've ended up falling away. Um, and I can tell you from a personal experience as well, um, from my own, uh, from the times that I've wanted to really leave and, and walk away from God, it's because of, it was during the times when I was very, very independent. So again, the purpose of the study is to help Christians build relationships within the church. Uh, the question is, why do we need relationships in the church? Well, again, just as the world sees relationships necessary for success in life, uh, those, uh, sorry, um, relationships in the church are necessary in life as a Christian. Uh, so those who are independent, we need to understand that uh, Christians who, are, uh, who act independent are uh, likely to fall away. They will fall away. Um, so what does this mean? That means that we as Christians in the church, we need to see each other outside of the church, not just inside. And also understand that these relationships that we have with one another in this room tonight, uh, they're meant to last a lifetime. Um, so I'm going to jump down to uh, the first point which is the one another scriptures uh, in the study. Um, there, we're going to go over uh, numerous scriptures that are going to instruct us on how uh, we ought to interact with one another. First one is in John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35. It says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So the scripture right here is obviously telling us to love one another. And this is Jesus here talking. He's teaching that Christians should have closer and better relationships mm -hmm. than people do in the world. And, um, and, and this is a command that he's giving us. And so Jesus is calling us to love each other. Why? So that other people can see that we are disciples. Mm -hmm. um, he's not calling us to love people so that people will see us as disciples. I think sometimes um, as Christians, we can be very tempted whenever we bring out uh, visitors. It's very, it's very tempting to just want to, you know, serve the visitors, love up on the visitors, but then at the same time, mistreat each other. Mm. But that's, that goes directly against what Jesus is telling us here. He's telling us that we need to love one another in order for other people who are coming in can see that we are disciples. Um, and so people can be moved by our love for others, but people will be moved for our love for one another. Mm -hmm. So my challenge to you from the scripture is to set your mind to make disciples your best friends. The next scripture is in uh, Hebrews 3, 12 through 14. It says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. So this scripture right here is calling us to have daily encouragement uh, toward one another. 
And, and from my perspective, to help someone uh, from falling away or becoming weak spiritually, we need to constantly be encouraging one another. And for us as a small church, it's very, very easy for us to fall into discouragement, mm -hmm. um, especially when we're going out and we're sharing our faith and we're studying the Bible with people and then we're finding cases of uh, multiple cases of people who can't even get past the seeking God study. It, it, it can really wear you out. It can it can wear you out spiritually. It can make you weak spiritually. And so this is this scripture, I, I think, is very key. Uh, for our church uh, currently at this stage, we need to be constantly encouraging one another. It, it can't just only be just text messages or just phone calls. I, I would even um, encourage you to actually be creative. Um, it, it just uh, it, encouragement will change people's hearts, mm -hmm. and it just think makes me think about all the birthdays that we've celebrated this year. Mm -hmm. um, even I mean, even for myself, um, again, I, I've shared about this several times, but it's like. You know, when, when you get all of that encouragement and people are just, you know, surprising you in your face and sitting you down and there's like a nice, uh, I don't know, 45 minute to one hour long sharing, it's, it's really moving. It, it really yeah. changes your heart. Um, and I can definitely say it encourages, uh, encourages me. And I even shared it too at the, at the birthday that um, I feel like I can go another year as a disciple. Mm -hmm. Come on. And so the thing is, though, is that we can't just be encouraging one another just only on our birthdays. Encouragement has to be a daily thing. That's what the scripture here is commanding us. And so my question to you is, when was the last time you went to after encouraging someone in the church daily? Because mm. and, and my, my thinking is this. Uh, again, as I, I just shared with where our church is at currently, uh, we need to be in constant uh, encouragement uh, towards one another. So my... I'm, it makes me think, like, if the entire church, if every single one of us in this room right now were to encourage each other every day for just one week, how will that change the church? Mm. What will that look like? How will our hearts change? So my challenge to you, to each and every one of you in this room right now, is to go after encouraging three people who do not live in your household Ooh. each day this week. Be creative and thoughtful. And so for, for me, it's kind of easy. I don't really have anyone in my household right now. I can just go after anybody. But, it, but the reason why I say outside of your household is because you can very easily encourage people within your household. But I, I do believe that it's a, it's a lot more challenging when you actually have to go after encouraging somebody outside of your household. So for me, being a single guy, I either have to encourage a sister or I have to encourage a married. Um, I, I even have the opportunity to encourage Jamie right here. But, um, but that's, that's the challenge. And, it, and it, again, it's... It's one of those things where with encouragement, it, it can really change your heart. And so um, I would even suggest the just because encouragement. And what I mean by that is just like, just send someone a, a nice text. Mm. Not because you're inclined to, not because you're challenged to, but because it's, it's just because. Um, it, it takes me back to a time where um, when I was in Sydney, I encouraged a, a sister. I was just, I don't know, like I, I, I have a really good friendship with her. Uh, some of you know her. Her name is Effie. Uh, when we were in, in the same ministry together, um, I was like, man. This girl, she's like one of my best friends. And I consider her as like one of my few. Um, but I, re I, I do recall uh, that one day I just, I was like, you know what? Let me just go to the store. I'm just going to buy her a card just to say how much I appreciate her. Aww. And there, there weren't any, no strings attached. There wasn't like no intention of like trying to like, you know, get some brownie points with her or anything. Like she was just genuinely my best friend. Aww, um, and, and, and I remember when I gave it to her, man, she was like, Tyrone, you're so awesome, bro. I appreciate you and everything. Mm -hmm. And and it's funny because like those are the those are the responses that you'll get. The best uh, types of encouragement are the just because types of yeah. encouragement. So again, that's my challenge to you is to go after encouraging three people every day this week who do not live in your household. And with that, I do believe that um that will definitely change our hearts as a church. Yeah. Uh, moving on, okay. in uh, Ephesians five nineteen to twenty. Uh, it says, speaking to one another in, uh, with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So the point from the scripture is that we need to worship God with one another. We need to sing out to God and each other with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Um, and, it, and it makes me think about this past Sunday uh, when, we, when we just had family time um, Pascal, Tim, and myself got together with the girls, and we had dinner and everything, and then we were just kind of, it, it was one of those things where it's like, we had dinner, and it's like, what do we do from here? 
<laughs> uh, we just kind of sat here just m trying to make conversation and then all of a sudden we just found we found ourselves just learning how to sing mm -hmm. and uh me i started having people like lay on the table <laughs> just to just so i can show them how to sing out of their diaphragm and and it was it was a funny thing but by the end of the night we were like oh let's sing this song let's sing that kingdom song mm -hmm. and it was such a great time yeah. did we sound great no but it was such a great time you know and that's that's what we need to start doing um in our church guys we need to start singing i'm um, not just any kind of song or anything like that i love billy eilish isabel i know you do too that's you know we, we share that uh commonality but we need to start also sharing kingdom songs with yeah. uh, with each other uh in colossians 1 28 to 29 it says he is the one we proclaim admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in christ to this uh to this end i strenuously uh contend with all the energy christ so powerfully works in me so the point of the scripture is that we need to disciple one another mm -hmm. uh, because this is essential in God's plan in order for each and every one of us to become more mature. And as we as we start to mature, we, we start to uh, learn how to instruct one another. That's why in the scripture in Romans 15, 14, it says, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another. Um, and it makes me think about the young Christians that we have in, in this room right now. It makes me think about Sephora, Tim, and Pascal. Um, it, it's been really great. I mean, we've been here for seven months now, um, but it, but I'm really I'm really impressed by the three of them because it's now I, I feel like they're they're starting to kind of get to that place where they're they're starting to share their thoughts or they'll if they see that something is wrong and they'll speak out against it. Um, Sephora specifically, she's always speaking out against me uh, whenever, I'm doing, whenever I'm doing something wrong. Um, but that just really goes to show that just the level of maturity. That's what that's what we need to have as well. We need to have that level of maturity where we start to really grow and we start to learn how to instruct one another. We can't always be the babies. Sean and Tegan, they're amazing leaders, but they can't always be the ones to be teaching us. We also need to learn how to grow and learn how to teach others as well. Uh, in Galatians 6, 1 through 2, it says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, uh, you will fulfill the law of Christ. So the point of this scripture right here, it means uh, it's telling us to gently restore one another and bear one another's uh, burdens. Um, from my perspective, as I mean, I've, I've been the leader. Um, I'm also looked at um, as an older Christian. To be honest, when I look at uh, the immaturities that, that I see from time to time, it's not even it's not just in this church or anything, but out of, in all the, it, it happens, guys, honestly. But in all the other churches that I've been to, it, it's very tempting for me to just kind of whip out the, the, the hand and just, you know, raise it up in the air and just really come down on people. It's very tempting to do that. Just trust me. Um, but the thing is, that the, the, amen. Uh, the Bible does not I command us to, to do that. We're, we're not meant to hurt each other. We, whenever we see that someone is caught in sin, it's, again, it's very tempting. Sometimes, like, I just look at the person, I'm like, you must be stupid. I'm sorry. Like, this is ridiculous. And, like, those thoughts honestly go through my mind. But the thing is, I have to be very gentle. I have to be very patient with that person. Um, and, it, and in a way, it kind of... Um, it reminds me of Sean in a way, um, and I mean not to say that like he's you know harsh or anything like that, um, but quite the opposite. Um, I, I appreciate his discipling because it's 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 a bit different than what I've received over the, the past several years. Um, like honestly, like I've been through uh, quite a bit, um, but Sean is always very patient with me, and for me, I, I'm a lot more receptive to a kind word than someone who's just kind of mm. going in at me. Yeah. Um, and so that, that helps me realize that with, uh, with disciples, a, a kind word um, actually really helps people. Um, yeah. It's not always about the rebukes. I think, um, I think sometimes we can be very focused on, on coming down hard on people or we can be very focused on, on rebuking someone really, really harshly. But sometimes those rebukes don't actually produce the righteousness in the person. Mm -hmm. um, and the scripture really helps me with seeing um, how I need to start approaching other, uh, other Christians. And it's, it's really awesome. But again, um, you know, some people are receptive to intense rebukes, but some people are also uh, receptive to uh, gentle corrections. Uh, moving on in James 5.16, uh, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So the scripture right here is now calling us to confess sins to one another. We need to learn how to discuss uh, openness and transparency, remembering that uh, openness breeds openness, 
So we need to start sharing our struggles with each other. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, this is what makes us very different from churches today. Um, people are more used to confessing only to God or just not confessing at all. Mm -hmm. uh, what this means is that people tend to fear man more than they actually fear God. It makes sense. Because if you're actually just going to God only, but you'll never say a single thing to a person about what you've just uh, committed, you're, you're actually fearing man more than you fear God. Mm -hmm. um, and I found an interesting um, quote uh, one time. Someone de uh, defined it very interestingly about confession. Uh, confession is confirming what the Spirit has seen. It was a really cool thing. As soon as, I, as soon as I heard that, I was like, wow. Confession is confirming what the Spirit has seen. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and the thing is with, with confession, it really, um, it, it's a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, even for me, being a, a Christian for seven years, you would think that, you know, I would be in the habit of, get, of getting open or it would be a lot easier to get open. No, it, it gets harder uh, to get open. Mm. But what's, what's awesome about it is that there's help that comes along with it. Um, it, it makes me think about um, uh, a GLC, which is uh, one of the, our church conferences that we have uh, once a year. Um, back in 2013, I had a, um, I had a discipler um, who was in, in a lot of wicked sin, um, one of which was um, uh, he actually fell into immorality. And, um, and at the conference, uh, he hid that for months. And then uh, at the conference, he decided to get open about it. And, um, and when he got open about it, there was a lot of stuff that came afterwards. He, this guy was, in, uh, was a former intern. He was in ICCM. And then this guy got taken out from all of that. And, um, and his relationships with a lot of the disciples, it changed. It was, there was a lot of hurt that came with that. But in the end, though, um, he ended up getting the help that he needed. Mm -hmm. And he ended up getting the healing that he needed as well from that. Um, and so, that's, so my challenge to you guys tonight, when it comes to confessing your sin, um, look at confession as something else than just getting vulnerable. Look at confession as a call to get help. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, that's, a, that's a, when, I, when I think of confession in that manner, it actually really helps my heart. Um, because, you know, it's, it's kind of hard for me to want to get vulnerable, but it's starting to get easier for me to want to get help. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my, my challenge to you with regards to um, confessing. But moving on in that verse, in uh, verse 17 to 18, it says, Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. So the scripture right here is now calling us to pray for one another. Once we've confessed to each other, we now pray for one another mm -hmm. uh, because it makes a difference. And, um, and I really appreciate um, the, uh, the D group that we had that one Sunday after church, um, mm -hmm. after uh, Sean had did the, the light and darkness study with us. He, he separated the men from the women. And the guys, we just kind of got through our, our D group quite quickly. The women, they took like an, an extra two hours after us. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but it, was, it was amazing because even for us um, as, as the brothers, we, we got open with each other. But afterwards, we, we all got on our knees and we just prayed together. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and I felt like that was the time, honestly, for, uh, from my heart, it, it, it felt like that was the, the point in time when things started to change in my relationship with Sean and even my relationship with the brothers as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's one of the things that we, we need to do with, uh, together mm -hmm. uh, when we're getting open with each other. We need to be praying um, to God uh, for, uh, for our sins so, just so that we can get that healing that we need in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, moving on in um, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 to 15, it says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. And to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. So this, the point of the scripture is, is, is calling us to be holy and prevent bad attitudes in one another. Um, and immediately, it makes me think about the friendship between uh, Pascal and Tim. Mm -hmm. uh, every time when I when I hear about Pascal and Tim, there's just always like you know that little bit of encouragement to one another. Yeah, they might have like they might just go back and forth every once in a while, but they're always willing to encourage one another. And I and I um, and I think Chris has done an amazing job in really bringing them both together yeah. and really uh, using them in a way to, to strengthen each other. Um, it's the most encouraging thing to see. And, and you guys have only been a Christians for just a few months now, um, and so I'm really inspired by that. But I think um, I think these two, when it comes to um, to really you know, holding each other together and things like that. I think of Pascal and Tim. They're, yeah. They have really incredible relationships. Uh, moving on in First uh, Thessalonians uh, 5, 12 to 14. It says, uh, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. So this right here, we this is 
commanding us on how we, uh, on what kind of outlook that we should have towards one another. We need to acknowledge even the small things in one another um, because it goes a long way. Um, sometimes, I mean, I, I would appreciate a thank you if I got, I mean, if for taking out the trash, you know, every once in a while. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. No, I'm just kidding. I love you guys. No, but but in, but in all seriousness, though. No, in all seriousness, um, the thing is, um, is that when it comes to encouraging with each other, encouraging each other, sometimes just saying thank you, uh, even for the smallest things, or just even saying you did a fantastic job at doing those dishes. Uh, well, that's kind of random, to be honest. But <laughs> but but the point is, yeah, <laughs> noticing. Um, not to say that you have to you have to go out and search for every little uh, every little work, uh, but the thing is is that it, it really goes a long way. Uh, moving on uh, in John seventeen verse twenty to twenty three, it says, "My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father, or maybe one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me." I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them, and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the, uh, then the world would know that you sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. So the ultimate goal of love and unity uh, within our relationships in the church uh, is world evangelism. Mm -hmm. You know, we can share for as long as we want, we can have 10 Bible studies each week, uh, but one helpful way of achieving world evangelism is by our love and our unity inside the church. Um, so that was the, uh, the first point uh, with regards to the, the one another scriptures. The second point is date and marry only disciples. Um, honestly, as a single guy, I feel like this one, <laughs> I don't know if I have enough experience for this one, but amen, God's word is still the same and it will be preached. Um, in 1 Corinthians 7, 39, it says, a woman is bound to her husband as long as she, as he lives. Mm -hmm. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. So the point of this right here is that marriage must only be in the Lord. Um, that's why in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to, uh, to 7, uh, verse 1, it's a long passage, but basically um, in the scripture is explaining that uh, the relationships, when it comes to your relationships, it, it only has to be between disciples. Mm -hmm. um, so dating as is marriage is a partnership where you are, are yoked together. The disciples must separate from unbelievers to receive the promises of God. So when it comes to marriage, it's not just about being romantic and feeling good, uh, but the purpose is to lead each other to God, ultimately yeah. help each other uh, get to heaven. Um, and there's a reason why God commands disciples with uh, dating and marrying other disciples. Um, if you look in uh, 1 Kings uh, 11, 1 through 10, and Nehemiah 13, 23 to 27, uh, it talks about the, uh, it, it goes over the study, uh, sorry, the story about Solomon. Um, basically, he had 700 uh, wives, and he just had so many women that, that weren't, um, that weren't Israelites. And so, and he knew of the, mm -hmm. the command that God had, had given the, the Israelites to not marry with anyone outside of, um, Israel. Um, mm -hmm. and so, so the thing is, is that even though he was commanded that, even though he knew the command, he still wanted to hold on to all the women. Um, so, so it's good for you to, to study this principle in the old Testament. Um, uh, but to date or marry outside of the faith is to be unfaithful to God. That is the Ooh. conviction that we need to have. Um, so, if you are single, I have a question for you. When was the last time you took someone on a kingdom date? Ooh, got quiet in here. <laughs> they got very, very quiet in here. So, the point is that we need, from this scripture, we need to learn how to build deeper relationships with one another. Because if you don't encourage your brothers and sisters regularly, would you say that you're ready to be in a dating relationship? Because here's the thing, you know, what I, what I notice is that, you know, sisters tend, they love to encourage the sisters. Brothers, they love to encourage the brothers, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some, I don't know, some of us, a lot of us, I don't know how many of us, we aspire to get married one day. Yes. No? <laughs> <laughs> so we, yes. We, we aspire to get married one day. But the thing is, if you're a sister and you say, I want to get married, but, the only, but you're only hanging out with sisters only, and you're only mm -hmm. uh, building deep relationships with sisters only, how are you going to learn how to build a relationship with your future husband? <laughs> you got to start getting out there and start encouraging your brothers. Brothers, i got to tell you the same thing. Now, you two, you're very young. Um, you just got out of high school not too long ago. But still, it's going to get to that point, though. It's going to get to that point. Um, I guess this is more related to, uh, to Jamie right here. 
uh, who was a little bit older, and maybe for the person who is uh, the young single man who's watching this right now. Uh, but, uh, the the challenge is to simply go on a kingdom date this Saturday. Come on. We need to start getting into the habit of encouraging one another. Sisters, we need to start encouraging the brothers. Brothers, we need to start encouraging the sisters. Get on it. First Peter 3, 1 through 7. It says, Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the uh, past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right, and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives, and treat them with, re with respect as the weaker partner, and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will, hi will hinder your prayers. So my question for the marrieds, if you are married, are you winning over your spouse in the Lord? I'll let that one marinate. <laughs> but um, la last point, um, with, uh, with building uh, relationships with each other in the church, of having best friends of all time, uh, what's practices also reconciling with one another? In Matthew 18, verse 15 to 17, it says, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So, from this scripture right here, we, we can see that, that Christians will sin against each other. We're sinners at the end of the day. But when someone sins against you, don't gossip uh, to somebody else about it. Talk to the person uh, who has hurt you so that you can win him or her over as a friend. So with church discipline, so with the scripture right here, this is what we use uh, to put into practice, uh, practice when it comes to uh, reconciling with one another. Um, so it says uh, in, in the next point that church discipline begins one-on-one -on -one and rarely should go to step two, three, or four. So what that means is it's in reference to the scripture that we just read. Um, and step two is when you bring a couple of uh, other disciples with you. Um, and then step three is basically when you tell, uh, when you tell the sin to the entire church. And then step four is when Jesus says, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Mm -hmm. But um, some of the best relationships, um, what's, what's incredible about this church, though, is that um, in, in God's church, it's commended that we need to reconcile with each other. If we have an issue with one another, we need to work this out. Yeah. Um, it's not meant to be um, a thing where I will just start bottling up my, my bitterness. If I don't like someone, I'm just going to hide it away from, from the person and I'm not going to say a single thing to them. I'm not going to work it out in my heart at all. Um, God is commanding us to do the exact opposite. Yeah. Uh, we're called to uh, to forgive one another. We're called to reconcile with one another. Um, and what's what's beautiful about this, though, is that after you get reconciled, there's always that feeling of refreshment in your relationship. There's always that feeling of just even feeling even closer. Um, it makes me uh, think about uh, one of my best friends, even today. Um, he's still my best friend to the to this very day. But when we first um, when we first were, uh, met each other, and we were in the same ministry. It wasn't really the the best uh, interactions between us. Uh, in the beginning, it was very um, it was a little rough because I didn't really know him. He didn't really know me. Uh, we kind of have uh, not so similar personalities. But it was because of the times where we basically sinned against each other, and we constantly reconciled with each other that brought us closer and closer and closer. And uh, years later, I ended up becoming a uh, best man at his wedding. Mm -hmm. wow. So um, my challenge to you tonight is, if you have issues with one another, uh, with another brother or sister, uh, get open and get through it together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so in conclusion, uh, when it comes to um, helping the disciple um, I build uh, best uh, relationships and have best friends of all time, we need to make sure that the disciple understands that one, relationships in the kingdom are essential. Two, disciples only date and marry other disciples. And lastly, Christians will hurt you in the church, but don't just leave it at that. Go get reconciled. Mm -hmm. And through this, they are sure to be on the first steps towards making best friends of all time, and that is a study. Come on. Woo!